So this morning we have the privilege of introducing uh, Margaret Winter, who's well known to House uh, Institute. Uh, she's currently uh, directing the Cal State University of La uh, Los Angeles audiology program, doctor of audiology program. And so uh, Margaret, it's good to see you again. And thank you for coming and sharing your talk on teamwork in the care of children who are deaf and hard of hearing. So thank you very much for taking the time to be with us today. I am happy to do it. Shall I go ahead? Please, yes. Okay. Well, thank you again for inviting me to do this and to talk about something that's been really important to me throughout my career as a pediatric audiologist, and that is teamwork and collaboration. We need you as audiologists and you need us, but we also both need uh, other professionals, highly qualified professionals in other disciplines because our kids are complicated. So we need to know who the people are in the community who are, are uh, professionals in areas such as OT and PT and developmental uh, pediatrics and speech and language. And there's a, a plethora of disciplines that are involved in caring for children who are deaf and hard of hearing. The, uh, the phrase, it takes a village, probably applies to a lot of different uh, areas of child care, but boy, if it ever did apply, it applies to the comprehensive care of children who are deaf and hard of hearing. The, the immediate relationship is between audiology and otology. Um, imagine that we are seeing a child who does not pass newborn screening. We identify the child as to type and degree of hearing loss, and then they need to be seen by ENT or otology. Um, in California, that's the law, can't be a pediatrician. So they need to come see you. And we need you to either rule out treatable hearing loss or treat it or advise watchful waiting, whatever it is that's appropriate to do. Or we need to have you provide medical clearance so that we can go ahead and fit hearing aids. And then we need to see them back uh, to see if treatment solved the problem completely, if it solved it partially, and now we need to know what their permanent hearing levels are, and we need your clearance to go ahead and fit hearing aids. So something that you can do for us that's really important is to try to get these kids in to see you quickly, um, however you can arrange your schedule. There, there's no point in doing newborn screening if we can't go forward with hearing aids as quickly as possible. And newborn screening operates on a 136 platform. We want to identify children by one month, fit them with hearing aids by three months, get them in, immersed in early start by six months. And there are lots of hiccups that can happen in this 136 platform, but we don't want making appointments either with you or with us to be one of those hiccups. So that would be very helpful to, to think about how to get those kids in very quickly. Especially for our kids who appear to have some kind of syndrome or they've got a family history, but actually for all children who have permanent hearing loss, we want to offer the opportunity for genetic testing. When I first began in audiology, of course, the question was always, why did this happen? And the answer was, we don't know in the vast majority of cases. But now there are actually things we can test for. And that is so helpful for some parents. Not all parents want genetic testing, but so helpful for some parents to know kind of what the future would look like. Is it likely that there are other systems involved? Is it unlikely that there are other systems involved? Might the hearing loss be progressive? That helps us know how often we need to see the child. Um, is it something that could be syndromic or something that's highly unlikely to be syndromic? And it helps them plan for, for future children. The, um, we can sometimes make that referral ourselves for genetic testing, but often that has to come from the physician. Vision exams are something that all children with sensory neural hearing loss should have. Um, it's, it's heartbreaking to, for me to look at my um, a cohort of children that I've seen over the years who have Usher syndrome. Um, I've seen several children with Nori syndrome, uh, several children with Wolfram. So there are several, uh, not just Usher, but other kinds of syndromes that involve vision. And we'd like to get on that sooner rather than later. Lots of these vision losses don't happen immediately hearing loss comes first, but we wanna be on it. We wanna not have it be something that maybe there was some intervention that could have happened earlier on if we had been aware of it. <clears throat> All children with profound sensory neural hearing loss should have an electrocardiogram. Um, that isn't typically done by pediatricians or at the behest of pediatricians. A Gervell and Lang Nielsen syndrome is rare. We don't see much of it, but we have seen several children in Southern California who have it. And of course it's critically important to know 
um, about that heart function. So that's another area where you would be important as a, as a referral source, because we wouldn't be able to do that. And also for all of our kids with sensory and neural hearing loss, we want to keep an eye on kidney function. So those are conversations that you can help um, to have with the parent and encourage these kinds of e evaluations and examinations. <clears throat> we also need you for something as simple as wax removal. Um, truly, the hardest thing that we deal with with babies and young children, especially if they've got a very significant hearing loss, is getting good ear molds. And if there's any wax in the canal, especially when we're trying to get a really, really good impression for a profound hearing loss, we don't we don't get good impressions if there's wax. Um, sometimes the parent will go to their pediatrician and they'll look and see a little bit of wax and say, oh, that's that's we don't have to do anything about that. But we do for our purposes, um, because, you know, no sooner do we get um, good impressions and good ear molds on babies, then they grow and then they don't fit anymore. And the several things that are bad about feedback. One is that they're not getting effective amplification, but the other is that if it is annoying enough, parents and caregivers, babysitters, daycare providers will just take the hearing aids off. And it can take as long as two to three weeks to get ear molds back from the lab once we take the impression. So imagine how long it is that a child is not having effective amplification or amplification most of the time if they're getting a lot of feedback. So this is another area where if you could please find your way to getting these kits in really quickly when we need wax removed, that would be a huge benefit to them. <clears throat> Going forward after we have been seeing a child and they're fit with hearing aids perhaps, we will certainly refer to you for if there's a sudden sensory neural hearing loss, that's rare in children, but it does happen. I can remember a, a 15 year old boy who was typically developing all things were working fine. He woke up one morning and his hearing was gone in both ears. Again, it doesn't happen very often, but we will certainly treat that as a medical emergency. More likely though, our kids are gonna have progressive hearing loss. And it could be take the form of a sudden drop from an existing sensory neural loss, or it could just creep down, down, down. And of course, we're going to refer a child to you if there's a change in hearing to see if there's any treatment that could be effective. We also hope that you'll do a CT scan and see if they have EVA or Mondini or some other uh, cochlear malformation. That really helps us know how to counsel the families. It helps us know how often to see the child that we want to stay on this and make sure that we have fit them with the most appropriate uh, sensory devices and programmed in the most appropriate way. If we identify a child as having auditory neuropathy spectrum disorder, we want to know if it's an isolated condition. There are a few genes that have been identified that appear to be uh, to lead to auditory neuropathy without a lot of other system involvement. And then there are other conditions where it's part of a constellation of symptoms um, or, or conditions. So we want to know that, and that may require uh, referrals to a pediatric neurologist, um, developmental specialist, and we need your help in doing that. We also, over time, will have some developmental concerns about children, and we want them to be fully evaluated so that they can get the help that they need. And that might include OT, PT, um, addressing concerns like ADD, ADHD, learning disabilities. Um, again, we need your help in referring to other physicians, um, which is something that sometimes we can do, but more often is effective coming from you. And of course, we're going to refer to you if we have evidence of otitis media. All of these things <clears throat> are going to be really important because they, knowing about them, knowing what the status is, impacts how we proceed with all kinds of things, with amplification, with whether they're a cochlear implant candidate, what communication strategies we would recommend and want to follow up. So uh, we need your help um, in these areas. Just a word about otitis media and sensory neural hearing loss. Children who have normal hearing and get otitis media have a hearing loss. So here's a, I don't know if you can see my little pointer here. If you look at the top audiogram here and imagine this is for both ears and not just for one ear, this is a child who typically has normal hearing. And with otitis media, they might have a 30 to even 35, 40 dB hearing loss in some cases. That's not great. It's like, you know, they're walking around with their fingers in their ears all day and that's not good. But they can still hear conversational speech, which falls in that blue area. 
they can still hear most of the sounds of speech. So while it's a problem, it's, it's a less critical problem than if we look down here at this audiogram on the left side, this is the permanent hearing level of this child um, in the moderate to moderately severe range. And with hearing aids, they're getting some good benefit. They're above the speech banana. They're just dropping into the top of it here with their high frequencies. But once they get otitis media, that same degree of hearing loss, now their hearing aid is essentially on a, it, it not even effective for them. They're at the bottom of the speech banana, if even that. So be aware of how much more uh, of an impact otitis media makes on a child who already has a sensory neural hearing loss. Given our druthers, insurance being what it is, if we can refer this child to you, the ENT or, or, or otologist, we'd rather do that than refer them back to their pediatrician because we're hoping that maybe you'll consider a, a bit more aggressive treatment for these children. A lot of audiologists don't like working with children. They don't like the uncertainty of it. They, they're not always easy to test and they don't always like working with the parents. Um, I remember one audiologist telling me about a mother that we, I, a child that I was seeing with them. Um, this mother just sucks the air out of the room. And I get that. I got that. But the fact is, um, I would have been that mother myself. And I probably was that mother, um, although my children don't have hearing loss. Um, so I understand that. But I think it's really important for us to always consider from the point of view of families, who likely have zero experience with hearing loss at all, and certainly no hearing loss experience with young children. 95% of our deaf children are born into hearing families. Most of them in my experience, one of the first questions they will ask is, is my child gonna be able to talk? Is my child gonna be able to go to regular school? That's their goal. They want them to be part of their sort of typical family um, uh, composition and communication. So we need to think about how devastating it is for families to get this news. They likely have no understanding of what an audiogram means. Even after we explain it to them, they don't have an understanding. My AUD students take a really long time to be able to look at an audiogram and imagine what that patient can actually hear. How do, how do I converse with them? Do I have to really raise my voice? Can I, do they not hear me at all? It takes them a long time to figure that out. And it takes parents a long time to figure it out too. It takes them, for example, a, a long time to understand if their child has normal hearing in the low frequencies, a profound hearing loss in the high frequencies, why they act as if they hear when they're, when they're very young. They do hear, they just don't understand. And so that concept takes a while to build. They need to hear this information over and over, and they need to hear it in different words, and they need to hear it out of different mouths and from different sources for it to really sink in and help them comprehend what is actually, what impact this hearing loss has on their child. On top of all this, about 30% of children with hearing loss have additional disabilities, and those require additional interventions across disciplines. So it isn't just hearing loss in a lot of cases, it's hearing loss plus other things. And in some cases, hearing loss is not the most urgent uh, issue that they have to deal with. So we need to keep that in mind when our parent shows up with a multiply disabled child and they forgot to bring the hearing aids, um, I'm pretty not judgmental about that. I get that. So with all of this, it can be really tempting to sort of create silos around ourselves where we say, well, this is what I do and this is what you do. And we don't really expand our, our knowledge about other disciplines, related disciplines. Um, at a multidisciplinary conference, for example, like a cochlear implant conference, these are the kinds of talks that you're going to see, otology, surgery, research, audiology, auditory verbal therapy, education. Um, and I like to go to the ones that are not audiology. I, I go to the audiology ones, of course, but I like to go to the other ones too. I love going to the surgery ones. I love going to the otology ones. I always learn something about uh, therapy techniques and strategies and education when I go to these conferences. So to the extent that that appeals to you, I would highly recommend it. Um, I, I think we need to learn about what each other does, not that we're going to overstep our, our step outside of our scope, but I don't know, I'm a big fan of education. And I think the more we know about all these related disciplines, the better we can serve our families. Um, truth be told, when I was a graduate student, 
I enjoyed my speech and language courses much more than I enjoyed audiology courses, but I really like the practical application of audiology and I still do. But I think it's a mistake that audiology has uh, fallen into in that it has separated itself educationally from speech and language. And I think we need to know about language development. We need to know it even if we're only seeing adult patients because our adult patients have had strokes and they've had brain injuries and they have brain um, uh, diseases. We need to know that. But as pediatric audiologists, we really need to know it. We really need to know about language development. So I wanna take a few minutes just to sum up this really complicated process that we all go through in developing language. We know from a lot of research that babies are born with a predisposition to language, and that usually, because most of our children are normal hearing, that development of language is linked to hearing. We know that the brain is primed to develop as it hears sound, as it's stimulated with sound. Those pathways get developed, they get strengthened. But what happens if we don't have continued stimulation or we never have any stimulation, they don't develop, or they begin to prune themselves and they begin to wither away. And we know that there's a critical period of auditory plasticity, and it's not very long. It, it peaks, according to many research studies, around three and a half years of age, after which it's never going to be as easy for the brain to make sense of novel auditory information. And it's, did I skip a slide? Yes, I did. Um, a typically hearing child learns language largely by overhearing, by incidental, um, I'm aware of people talking, I'm aware of the words that they use. We don't sit down with our toddlers and didactically teach them vocabulary words. We don't teach them grammatical structures. They perceive it, they figure it out, they absorb it. I was um, back east with my five-year-old granddaughter a few weeks ago, and we were tossing a ball back and forth. And she said, I catch the ball. And I said, yes, you did. You caught the ball. And she said, yes, I caught the ball. Now, that may not last. She may continue to say, I catched things for a while. But eventually, that's just going to, she's going to absorb that. And we don't have to sit down and explain irregular verbs to her. Um, the subtleties of semantics are sometimes lost on children with hearing loss. I remember a, a video of Doreen Pollock, who was an early pioneer in auditory verbal therapy, working with a kid who looked to be about 12 or 13 years old. And she asked him to use the word ancient in a sentence. And he thought for a minute and he said, my mother is not ancient. So of course everybody laughed, but most of our typically hearing 12 and 13 year olds would know that ancient is not a word that one typically applies to one's mother if they, if they wanna live long, but they, but they talk about buildings and they talk about um, you know, things that, that are actually ancient. And sometimes our hearing impaired kids, kids don't get those subtleties. They also may have difficulty with emotional content, reading when somebody is happy or sad or angry. So our kids with hearing loss require more direct intervention, both from parents and professionals, in order to have sophisticated development of, or development of sophisticated language. So auditory learning is tricky. Think about all the things that we need to do as we're learning to talk. We need to hear and recognize sounds, they need to remember the sounds that they hear. They need to order them in a particular way. They need to put sounds together to make a word. They need to understand what the word means. They need to put it in a sentence in a way that makes sense. That's a lot of stuff to do for a very young child. And yet, this is what our typically hearing kids do. Between one and two years of age, their receptive vocabulary is about 200 words, and they can say about 50 words. Between two and three years of age, all the way up to five years, maybe when they start school, they've gone from 3,000 words receptively to 70, basically doubled and then some, their receptive vocabulary to 7,600 words. And their expressive vocabulary quadruples from 425 words, roughly, to 1,700 words. That's a really amazing thing. And our kids with hearing loss need more direct intervention in order to approach the kind of language development that a typical hearing child does. In the end though, it's about language. To the extent that we can provide and support an avenue for language development through the auditory modality by providing um, hearing aids, cochlear implants, bone conduction devices, we certainly wanna do that, that's what we do. But there are children who do not, cannot develop language through audition. 
or whose families opt for sign language, for visual language. And in those cases, we want to encourage and support that. Along with that though, parents need to understand that if their choice or the necessity means that their children are going to be using sign language as their primary or only means of language, they have a huge role in that. They still need to be the language models for their children, which means they can't be learning sign language behind their children. They can't be learning sign language from their children. They need to get out ahead of it. And we need to help them find avenues to learn as parents, as families, to incorporate sign language into their whole family. Siblings need to learn sign language. It can't be that the child who's using sign is the only one in the family that signs and everybody else is talking. And then the child with sign language communication is marginalized. Everybody needs to be on board. And children who are using sign language need the same peer-to-peer -peer communication that children who are talking need in order to strengthen their language. So these things are challenging for families. It sounds easy and lovely to learn sign language, but they have a huge role in it that may be difficult for them if they're working three jobs or if they're not speaking English as their primary language and they're trying to learn English. Now this is another language that, that we're asking them to learn or we're telling them is important for them to learn. So they need a lot of support if this is the choice that they make or this is the, uh, this is the avenue for communication. So all that to say that early identification, early intervention are critical for the development of language, especially listening and spoken language because for a child with hearing loss, that's not their most intact modality. It requires a lot more work. Also, though, in our postlingually deafened children or children who have progressive hearing loss, the, the preservation of those pathways, the strengthening of those auditory pathways are really important. We want to get devices on them as soon as possible. We want to change the device if that's what it means. If hearing aids are no longer effective, we need to look forward to cochlear implantation earlier rather than later to keep those synaptic connections going. I want to talk a little bit about devices and your role as physicians in the, in the provision of devices. Um, ENT otology, as I mentioned, will need to see a child prior to our fitting them with hearing aids to give medical clearance. That's going to be true every time we sell new hearing aids to a child. And that doesn't matter that they have stable sensory neural hearing loss that hasn't changed in a million years. Every time we need to provide new hearing aids, you need to provide medical clearance. At least this is true in California for every kid under, under 17. Um, and that's usually every four to five years. CCS, California Children's Services, pays for hearing aids for children every four years. On top of that, CCS requires that if a child loses a hearing aid and it's not on replacement warranty, you got to provide auto clearance for those children too. Even though it's the same hearing aid we're going to provide, they still have to come back and see you. So please, please try to expedite these appointments for auto clearance, even in kids who are already wearing hearing aids, because if a child loses a hearing aid and they're on CCS, they have to come see you. Then we have to put in an application. We have to wait for CCS to say, okay, then we can order the hearing aid. Then we can get them back on the air. So it takes time. And we don't want these appointments to be a reason that it takes even longer. For our kids with permanent conductive loss, with the exception of atresia, microtia, um, very stenotic canals, convention he conventional hearing aids are usually the best option. So our kids that have ossicular malformations, um, but they have an ear canal, we're not going to fit them with a bone conduction aid. We're going to fit them with a conventional hearing aid. But please let us know if the child, if you're seeing that child for chronic drainage, and that's gonna be a problem for us fitting conventional hearing aids. We need to know that from you. Even if on the day that we see the child for the hearing test, their ears are dry, we need to know from you that a bone conduction device is gonna be the better choice. For non-surgical bone conduction devices, we need auto clearance from you just like with conventional hearing aids. And that's for each processor purchase. The FDA says that you can do surgical Baja Ponto type device for children five and up. And for Osea and Bonebridge, 12 is the age that FDA approves. But uh, I know that some surgeons provide that surgical option sooner. So if you're one of those, we'd really like to know that from you so that we can make the appropriate referrals. We've been seeing a child for, you know, since they were babies, 
we need to know if you're happy to do a surgical uh, uh, Baja at three instead of five. Um, if we have a child who's been wearing Baja all this time and now they're 10 and a half or 11 and they need a new processor, do we get a new processor or are you okay to go ahead and do an OCO or a bone bridge surgery before they are 12? We'd like to know that from you. And we also need to know if you do the surgery, when you do the surgery, when it's okay for us to fit the processor so that we can schedule out those appointments and know that we can get them in on time. Cochlear implants. We know, we know from a plethora of studies and from our own experience that earlier is better. So when we have a child with a congenital hearing loss or a very early onset loss, we wanna get implants on them as soon as possible if they are candidates. For our older children, same thing. We don't want them to struggle any longer than they have to. And as candidacy criteria change, we need to always have that in mind that a child who wasn't a cochlear implant candidate five years ago, and they assume they still aren't, we want to be sure that we stay on it and say, you know what, criteria have changed and uh, devices have changed and options have changed. We now have hybrid devices that we can fit a much wider range of, of hearing losses with cochlear implants. And our older kids may be getting A's in school, but they're working way, way, way hard to do it. So we want to keep on that for our older kids as well. For our progressive hearing loss children, we want to talk about implants once we know what the trajectory is. Um, it's starting to go down, down. They may not be implant candidates yet, but let's get them on the radar. Let's get, let's look at an evaluation uh, to, because we know where this is going and we'd rather do it sooner than later. We know that optimizing both the selection of candidates and the outcomes for children with cochlear implants happens best when we work as a team. So as soon as it's likely that you see a child who may be a candidate, get them on the radar of either your program if you're a, a cochlear implant surgeon or your favorite implant center, because it takes a long time to do the evaluations, to go through insurance, to go through in California's CCS, uh, can take a really long time to approve these children, and we want to get on it as soon as we can. All of that said, in a team approach, it's really important that we wait till all the evaluations, all the information is in before we say, oh, your kid is a great candidate for a cochlear implant. And here are some examples. The child has no support system. There's no educational program that's established for them. Parents are known to be flaky. They don't keep appointments. They don't, we, we have issues with that support system. Doesn't mean the child isn't going to be an implant candidate, but we want to have those discussions first. And we want to talk about putting systems in place uh, first before we give the final word. The child is older and has no auditory experience. From a surgical point of view, it doesn't matter to you. You can implant a, a child at 10 who has no auditory experience just as easily as one who's 10 months, but the outcomes are not going to be as good and perhaps the outcomes are not going to be good at all. So we need to talk about what the goals are that the family has and how likely the uh, cochlear implant is going to help them achieve those goals. Child has additional disability disabilities and the family needs extensive counseling to understand that some of these disabilities might mean that apart from hearing loss, the child is gonna have difficulty developing spoken language. With hearing loss, it's highly unlikely. Doesn't mean they're not an implant candidate, but we need to talk about expectations. One of the sort of saddest uh, experiences I had was a child who um, we, she, had profound hearing loss. We went through the whole evaluation. We were a go. The parent even had gotten insurance where she hadn't had it before um, so that, that would she could get coverage for a cochlear implant. CT scan was done last, absent cochleas. So especially when we see a child where we get no response on the audiogram, no response from hearing aids, we would hope that you would want to do your imaging earlier rather than later. I know you don't always want to do CTs early on a child because it's a lot of radiation that they don't need uh, if the child isn't otherwise a candidate. But if we really suspect that there's something going on in the formation of the inner ear or the auditory nerve, we'd like to know that up front. Older child doesn't want it. So they may be a great candidate on paper, but they're not having it. And if they don't want it, they can simply take the 
external equipment off and that's the end of that. And in fact, that 15 year old boy I mentioned earlier who had the sudden hearing loss was scheduled for cochlear implantation. He came over to us so that we could do the rudimentary things that we do for making sure that he's a candidate on our end. And our speech pathologist came to us and said, no way, this guy does not want it. So we sat him down and we uh, put him in touch with other teenagers who had gotten cochlear implants and he emailed with them, met with them. And within a month he was ready to go. And he's done great with his cochlear implants. But had we pushed ahead with it without considering his wishes, it would not have been as successful. And finally, you may be willing to do the surgery, but the insurance plan isn't willing to pay for it. CCS, for example, has very strict criteria of, about who is a candidate in their program and who isn't. So maybe a surgical candidate, but we would not be able to get authorization to go forward. So your role, of course, is to determine if the child is medically a candidate. In many, most programs that I'm familiar with, the families choose the device. If that's not the case for you, if you only use one device or you only like one device, or in this particular case, based on the imaging that you've done, you want a particular device or particular electrode, please let us know so that we are appropriately counseling the families. You choose the electrode, which of course used to be an easy task, but it's less so now because you got a lot of choices. Um, but if we're filling out the order form, make sure we know exactly what it is we're supposed to order. So, because yeah, we got a lot of choices on that form. You determine the ear, whether it's one ear or both ears or which ear. Um, not all families actually want bilateral implants, even though their child is a candidate for it. Um, in some cases, you may choose, you, you really would rather just do one at a time and see what happens. So that's something that we want you to discuss with the family so that we're on the same page with that and we don't tell them the wrong thing. Uh, we like it when you will counsel the families regarding required vaccinations. Um, sometimes that task falls to us. We would prefer that it fall to you uh, because families have a lot of medical questions about vaccinations, especially now in this environment that we're in about vaccines. Um, if you can have those conversations, we would appreciate it. And your, of course, your people are going to counsel families regarding what to expect before and after the surgery itself. The audiologist is often the port of entry, though. They don't usually come to you first. They come to us very often as the port of entry because we're referred by, they're referred by their auditory verbal therapist, their speech pathologist, their school, um, or families' word of mouth. Um, families talk to each other. And so sometimes they come to us first, often because we've seen the child regularly from babyhood. Um, and our job is to determine if the child qualifies based on their hearing levels, on their speech perception. We wanna know if they're optimally aided. We don't wanna be doing a cochlear implant on a child who can do just as well with hearing aids, but they've been poorly aided. Um, does the child receive less than adequate benefit from hearing aids? When we're talking about really little ones, we really need to know more than just what we can see in the sound booth because we can't do speech perception testing on a one-year-old um, the, the way we can on an older child or an adult. We want to know what the goals are of the family and are they likely to be achieved by a cochlear implant? If they are expecting their kiddo to do, you know, to recite the Gettysburg Address next year when they're next week when they get a cochlear implant, they need some counseling. If their child has dis additional disabilities that can get in the way of their ability to participate in programming or in a therapy program afterwards, we need to have a conversation about realistic goals. And perhaps most importantly, if the child is not a CI candidate, what is the plan going forward? We don't ever wanna say, nope, not a candidate in our program, bye. We, wanna, we want to help them move forward in whatever the most appropriate ways would be. Once the child is determined to be a candidate, it is usually the audiologist, unless you choose otherwise, to present the device options. We explain the equipment, we help the family through that decision-making process. We really try to help families understand that while there are pros and cons to each and every implant system, it's not gonna matter which one they choose in terms of how well their child will do. They can throw darts and whatever they choose, their child is gonna do just as well with that device as they would with either of the others. So we counsel about reasonable expectations and we connect them with educators and therapists as needed. Speech pathologist is an important member of the team and speech pathology is certainly a broad um, area. And so we want it to be 
a specialist who works with children who are deaf and hard of hearing. Speech pathologist looks at how the child is communicating. Are there communication limitations expected in view of their hearing loss? In some cases, we have a child who is actually getting pretty good benefit from, from their hearing aids and they're doing nothing with the development of their spoken language. That's a red flag, that's a concern to us. We don't know necessarily that a cochlear implant per se is gonna be the answer if, if the child is having difficulty processing, requires a lot of counseling and a lot of intervention. What will their communication needs be post-implant? Are they in the right program now? Do we need to bridge into another program? Or again, if the child is not a candidate, what their communication needs are gonna to continue to be. Psychologists can be a, a good consultant where there are concerns about a child's developmental status. Psychologists can help us flesh out that picture. And where there's an older child who's ambivalent about a cochlear implant or they're at odds with what their parents want for them, uh, counseling sessions with families with a psychologist can be helpful. We don't ever want a child to show up in a classroom with a cochlear implant and have it be a surprise to the teacher. So we want to involve the educators. We want to involve the child's therapist, whether it's a speech language pathologist or an AVT, auditory verbal therapist. Um, we wanna know what the school options are. Um, are they already in a spoken language program? Are they in a sign program, a total communication program? How can we transition them so that they are in what is a strong auditory learning environment? Auditory verbal therapists may be the best qualified to work with children who have sensory devices, but they might need to be a community partner rather than a member of your team. I've been fortunate to work in situations where we could get a grant to have an educator as part of our team on, on the premises, and it's been completely invaluable. It's just been a wonderful addition to the team. But an auditory verbal therapist can be an audiologist with a license, a speech language pathologist with a license, or a teacher who doesn't have a professional license and therefore we can't bill insurance for them. So if you employ a, a teacher, an educational specialist, you're, you're gonna need a grant for that. But I encourage you to look into the possibility of doing that. And a word about educators and auditory verbal therapists, they know who we are, they know who you are. They get an earful from parents. They hear if we're wonderful, they hear when we're not wonderful. Um, and we have a reputation based largely on our interactions with families, um, families talk. So I recommend that you take advantage of any opportunity that you have to work with educators, to work with therapists, to present, to talk with them. Um, Dr. Luxford and I, for many, many years, talked to the summer uh, session families at the John Tracy Clinic. And it was a really great opportunity. I think he would say that he really enjoyed doing it too. And on the rare occasions when he couldn't do it and I couldn't get a, another physician to go with me, parents really missed that. I could answer most of their questions, but they really wanted to hear it from him. And they would have many, many questions for him afterwards. And he was very engaged uh, with the families. And it, he became, at least in the John Tracy uh, community, I think for a long time, he was the go-to guy. And so they can be, families and teachers and therapists can be a really strong source of referrals. So thinking about team communication and cochlear implants, the best candidates are easy. They are clearly medically candidates. They're clearly audiologic candidates. Everybody agrees with that. Families are on board. They've got programs in place. Easy, easy. But where this isn't the case, it doesn't necessarily mean the child isn't a cochlear implant candidate. It means that we need to talk a little bit more about where the hiccups might be and where the misconceptions might be and what other services need to be put in place and who we need to reach out among our community partners to make sure that the children, if, they, if and when they do get a cochlear implant, are fully supported. Um, it may mean going ahead with less than ideal candidates, depending on the circumstances. For example, child is older than we would like them to be, but this is the last chance to do it where we're going to get a decent outcome. With progressive loss, we might want to do it sooner rather than later. It, with a child who's losing vision, even if they're otherwise not a great, great candidate, they're going to need to be able to hear, and we want to help them do that the best they possibly can. Um, a child with auditory neuropathy may not look like a candidate audiologically on paper, but 
they're doing nothing with their hearing aids and their, their only option really is a cochlear implant. And a lot of our kids with auditory neuropathy do really, really well with cochlear implants. Um, so if they're otherwise a good candidate, they're probably going to be a good candidate. But these are all conversations that we want to have um, as a team. Here are some things that we talk about with parents, regardless of the device, regardless of the degree of hearing loss. And we say these things over and over and over and hope that it sinks in. We often see that it sinks in, but we continue to repeat consistent use of hearing technology. When we have data logging on our hearing aids and our cochlear implants, we don't use it to say, you're not putting the hearing aids on often enough, or you're not wearing the, the cochlear implant often enough. What we do say is, this is what data logging is telling us. Let's walk through your day and figure out when the hearing aids go on, when they come off, when they don't necessarily go back on in time, how can we help you increase wearing time? We tell them that we want communication to be easy rather than difficult. So get their attention first and make a strong auditory learning environment in your home. Talk to them, read to them, sing to them, read to them from the very get-go, even if you think they can't hear you, develop those habits. Use familiar vocabulary with them and then expand it. It's not just the ball, it's the blue ball with the red stars. Simple sentence structure so they can understand you, provide correct modeling and expand that. Make your sentences a little bit longer. Reduce noisy environments, reduce distance situations so they can hear you and understand you better. Children with hearing loss, even if it's mild hearing loss, rely on visual cues. Even if they have pretty good aided hearing, they do. So let them see you, let them do face-to-face -face conversation. Be aware that they have a good ear or a better aided ear. Stay within that listening bubble so they're not struggling to hear and understand. And we encourage the use of remote microphone technology, Roger systems, FM systems, remote microphones that come with hearing aids and cochlear implants. Children sitting in the back seat of a car in Los Angeles, they're driving an hour to get to school. That's a language learning opportunity. Use that remote microphone technology. And so to the extent that you see children with hearing loss, and you're going to see them at least every four years. You're going to see them more often if they have otitis media. You're going to see them more often if they need wax removed. We recommend that you check in with families about how the child is progressing in their communication development and offer those same kinds of tips to them on good communication strategies. Reinforce positive but reasonable expectations. Reinforce the idea that the more they wear their devices, the better they're going to do. We are a team, and this is an and statement and a but statement. Of all team members, you should know that it's possible that your word is going to be the most important to parents. And I just, I remember back, my very first job was working for Victor Goodhill and his colleagues. And Victor Goodhill used to tell his patients, oh, you have the same hearing loss that I do, and I have three pairs of hearing aids, and they don't help me at all. And that effectively talked them completely out of even trying amplification. I loved Victor Goodhill, by the way, he was marvelous. And his also marvelous colleague, Seymour Brockman, used to write bicross on the discharge papers when he meant binaural hearing aids. And patients would come to us and say, he said, I need a bicross. We would say, no, you don't need a bicross, you need two hearing aids. But he said, he said, I need a bicross. So honestly, I don't think things have changed very much since then. So what you say is really important and parents need consistent information from all team members. I wanna close with this quote because I think it really sums everything up that we do for, for and with our children and families. If kids come to us from strong, healthy, functioning families, it makes our job easier. If they don't come to us from strong, healthy, functioning families, it makes our job more important. <laughs>